Hello and welcome to Melbourne City of Literature's uh, latest Between the Lines series. My name is Astrid Edwards and today I am talking to Eloise Grills. I live and work on Jaja Waring land, uh, which is about an hour north of Nam, Melbourne, and I pay my respects to elders, um, past and present, and I note that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Eloise, welcome. I think we might live nearby. You're also on Jaja Waring land, is that correct? Yes. I was just about to say I'm also on Jar Jar Warring Land. So um yeah, we'll have to see where each other are and maybe <laughs> some for coffee. Absolutely. I would love that. Eloise, <laughs> I uh, am really thrilled to be talking to you today about big beautiful female theory. For those watching who are not in Australia, this is physically a beautiful book. Uh we're obviously going to talk about Eloise's work, but this is a graphic memoir, um, you know, pink on the pages, beautifully illustrated um, by Eloise herself. Um, and I feel like I should give a little bit of your bio, which is always a little bit embarrassing, but I am going to do it, Eloise. You <laughs> are an award-winning uh, artist and writer. Um, your essays have been published all around Australia, including in the Saturday paper, Kill Your Darlings, Mianjin Literary Journal, and others. Um, your first published collection, uh, Big Beautiful Female Theory, was shortlisted for the Stella Prize this year uh, and was also, and I have it written down here, highly commended in the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards uh, for nonfiction as well. Before we dive into Big Beautiful Female Theory, though, I would like to um, ask you about your recent comic uh, in The New Yorker about landlords, and the actual title is Affirmations for the Landlord Facing Adversity. <laughs> yeah um what would you like to ask about <laughs> uh well um firstly um that was very good you had me laughing but maybe a practical question given our audiences you know the cities of literature network how does a graphic artist a graphic writer get a comic in the new yorker on a topic that so many people around the world are thinking about um through the slush pile <laughs> I literally just um emailed them and um I, I had this idea for a while and I was like well um you know it's always been a goal of mine to be published by the New Yorker because if you know if you're a cartoonist it's like you know the most read cartoons in the world um and you know their daily shouts are quite nice and satirical and funny and um I thought it would be quite fun also I feel like probably um a fair few landlords read the New Yorker so I feel like it would be a good place to sort of put it um to sort of uh, air out a bit of my grievances but um actually I, my um my mother-in-law sent it to someone though and like she was like is this satire they didn't quite get like they thought that it was actually like for you know a positive thing for landlords and she would have to explain no 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 it's it's you know it's satire which is you know if, if you're not familiar with the daily shout sort of format you might not realize but yeah so that was very exciting and then I got an email back and they said yeah we'll publish it and um yeah it's been really thrilling so I'm going to keep on trying to like you know put my work out there in that sort of way because it was a really fun project uh and basically I was working on my digital illustration skills so I was like I want to you know practice this and that was part of it like putting together that comic uh, well, I feel uh, your practice uh, went immediately global, so well done. Um, and for those watching, I really recommend um, looking it up. It's called um, Affirmations for the Landlord Facing Adversity by Eloise Grills in The New Yorker, and it will make you smile and possibly alleviate some of your um, inner rage and anxiety about the state of housing uh, in the world. Um, uh, now, moving on from that, um, you have just returned in the last few months from an international residency in Paris. Um, I am jealous of that, but I also wanted to ask you, you know, you got to do that um, residency after the publication of Big Beautiful Female Theory. So, you know, your work um, in, um, you know, really profound form is out there around the place and you were abroad. What was it like to you know, take those prize listings and, you know, the book sales and kind of look back from afar? What what did you, um, what was that experience? Um, it was pretty incredible. Um, it was, 
I have to say I'm like I'm just about to do my um, acquittal for my grant and things like that so huge thank you to the Australia Council for the funding and for um, to the Keezing Studio for the space and it was an incredible experience. Um, I it was pretty I don't know being on the world stage like that it sort of makes you realize the sort of smallness of our little industry there and here and I guess like how lucky we are to sort of have I don't know like it's um it seems to be a little bit easier here to get published and things like that not necessarily that it is easy I'm not saying that but it's like I feel like it's really nice coming from this sort of smaller community where um we sort of have all this support and it seems like yeah it's a bit uh wilder overseas but um yeah, it was a really beautiful experience and I met so many people and, you know, went to so many museums and I think it's, yeah, I think it's something that I'm just going to be thinking about for years to come. It was three months, but it felt like it was, you know, three years. It was very long and uh, like, yeah, I just feel like I had so much growth in that time. That's beautiful to hear, Eloise. You know, we both live in Australia and, and you know, ha- have been formed by um, kind of, I guess, the Australian mindset. I've always read um, uh, comics and graphic novels and I'm beginning to read works of graphic nonfiction, but not a huge amount has traditionally been published in Australia. I've read stuff that has been published abroad and imported here. That is changing now. And you are one of the people who are changing that. But what are your observations on, I mean, I guess France specifically, but how the European markets kind of interact with um, graphic works compared to Australia? Oh gosh, it's like no comparison. It's like uh, the French um, absolutely love graphic novels. um, And you go to bookshops and they're front and centre. Um, there's so many of them. There's so much variety. Um, my French is not great, but I'm like currently that's my sort of project at the moment. I'm trying to read some graphic novels in French um, to sort of enhance my skills a little bit. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing how, how um, strong that um, sort of graphic novel sort of culture is over there and how wildly read they are and things like that um and you know going to the library and you know in Australia I'm used to going to the library and there's this little section um and in the library there's like shelves and shelves and shelves of them and so many different genres and styles so yeah it's um it's pretty inspiring and it's pretty exciting to see I guess like what can be done and sort of as an inspiration for what could be done in Australia I am. Uh, I am looking forward to the shelves in Australia uh, getting um, uh, more diverse and, and broader with works um, that you know include illustrations and are works of graphic art as well as storytelling. So, can you introduce us? And I know you've done this before, Eloise, but can you introduce us to the beauty that is big, beautiful female theory? Sure. So it's a collection of um, comics and visual essays exploring the topic of um, the body and particularly it's like through this through memoir so it's exploring my relationship with my body through various forms um, and particularly like thinking about um, the fat body in our culture and the way that it's sort of objected and rejected Um, and it's sort of like a it's my way of claiming that space back and doing that through humor and through satire and through um you know visual depictions and uh paintings and all these kinds of things to sort of figure out a way of being in the body that feels um right to me or that um feels uh yeah that feels not necessarily I'm not like um I'm pretty what's it called it's sorry first thing in the morning for me I'm not an early riser um it's not just about body positivity, which I find can be a bit more of sort of like a marketing term, um, but maybe like body neutrality or um, body reality. So being really honest about the ways that um, our society makes us feel about our bodies and putting that into artwork. Is Big Beautiful Female Theory available abroad yet? 
No. I have had quite a few um, messages from people saying, oh, is it available in the UK and things like that? But no, haven't got an international um, publisher for it yet. Um, okay, so my next question is, is there an ebook? Um, also, no. <laughs> it would be, it would I work be on that, Eloise. For those watching, um, some of the essays in this uh, collection were published um, online beforehand. So it is absolutely possible to read some of the essays in Big Beautiful Female Theory. I'd like to kind of um, uh, pull out some of the uh, essays in here. But before we get to that, Eloise, like, can you kind of talk us through what is involved in creating um your choice of essay um one of your works so obviously you are a writer but you are also an artist and they meld together in this form so you'd like me to talk through one of the essays yeah like your process of creation and um you know does the art come first does the words come first is it um you know that creative urge to make a point like <laughs> um yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's probably a good, like the first essay um, is probably defined, I guess, like not defined, but like um, instigated some of my sort of process for the book. So yes, the, the um, first, the title essay, Big Beautiful Female Theory, um, and those collages came a lot later. So they were something that I was sort of, um, you know, trying to come up with an idea um, for the covers and things like that. And then um my editor actually really liked this collage that I did. Um, I actually did the front cover collage for the first essay. Um, and then they were like, no, we want to use that as the cover. So then I like, um, then I did, you know, different ones for each of the essays inside. Um, but yeah, definitely start, I started off with text. Um, and it was almost like I sort of, I opened this document and it was just like, I don't know, it just stopped like started to flow out of me and I was always wanted to do something sort of about the body and my relationship to it and I've always you know I sort of have written about that before but not as explicitly and so it was sort of yeah it felt like almost like a sort of bloodletting like putting everything on the page and um you know thinking about like I guess like a lot of it was sort of um uh intrusive sort of thoughts that I'd had um and you know the way that I sort of think about things or like little like rhymes that are sort of like going around in my head <laughs> all the time. Um, so just, yeah, really like, like unguardedly sort of writing this, all this down. Um, and then I um, did some illustrations, but there were sort of more of the black and white ones that you see in the book. Um, uh, for example, oh, not black and white, but like with this bluey sort of gray color. Um, and, and then I sent I sent it to some friends because I had like a writing group at the at that time. So um, a few people like uh, Rachel Ang and um, Aaron Billings and uh, uh, now I can't, my brain is not working. But um, you know I had a group, little group of friends who looked at it and they, they said you know we really like this but it's quite heavy. It's quite depressing. Like it needs a bit of levity in it. And so that's when I sort of um, you know added a lot of color imagery and. Um, you know, really emphasize like, like I wanted the book to be really comical and humorous and that sort of thing. So, you know, really playing with that because, you know, while it is kind of a bit of heavy subject matter throughout, I never wanted people to feel like bogged down in it while reading. Like I wanted it to have sort of um like to be like a little voice talking to the person and like leading them through the ideas and playing with them rather than feeling like I was sort of bashing someone over the head with it the first time I you know cracked open big beautiful female theory you had me laughing really quickly and like that kind of laughing where I'm like oh my god I can't believe she wrote that or I can't believe she drew that but like really in an engaged way and you know this has now been out for about a year um so you know you've found an audience. Um, I'm older than you and I really enjoyed this work, but I'm actually, I teach and I find that my students, my younger students talk about Big Beautiful Female Theory and are deeply impressed that I have read it. Um, so what are the responses that you have received over time? And is there a difference in terms of, you know, um, age? Yeah, for sure. I feel like yeah, I feel like when I was writing, I was sort of trying to write to like a slightly younger version of myself, like as 
um, you know, that's often like if I'm writing memoir, it's sort of like what would I have wanted to read when I was a few years younger and when I was dealing with these things more squarely than I am now. So I really appreciate, I really love the idea of um, young younger people reading it and really engaging with it. Um, I have had older people um, engage with it as well and uh, a lot of their sort of feelings about it was like, oh, yes, I remember going through this and I remember what it was like and, you know, having sort of a positive experience in that way. Um, I've had a few um, people say, oh, you know, I don't know, maybe like some older people reading it and saying, oh, you know, she's so hard on herself and, I, you know, a, a little bit... Um, <sighs> not condescending but a little bit like oh you know poor thing sort of thing and I feel like perhaps I've been a little bit defensive about that because I'm like you know I'm playing with these ideas and I'm playing with the idea of like how I sort of see myself um and I'm never just you know um I don't know I feel like I have dealt with it in that sort of way and I sometimes feel like that's a little bit like uh yeah, a little condescending, but um, I sort of understand that as well because I feel like once you've been through all this stuff, once you've been through all this, um, you know, dealing with uh, coming to terms with your body and stuff, you look back at it and you go, oh, you know, I'm really, I'm really sorry for that earlier version of myself. I'm really sorry for how her and how she felt. So, yeah. I agree. Um, thank you for sharing that. I guess, um, uh, you know, I am older than you, but not decades older than you um and you know as I you talk a lot about patriarchy and, and misogyny and kind of the societal expectations that we put on the female body and that we internalize and then there's also um you know there is the idea of social media and the internet in big beautiful female theory as well and how that entire world that didn't exist you know two decades ago um feeds into this and I know there's no answer to the question I'm about to ask you Eloise and I'm not sure if anyone has asked you this before but you know I'm online all the time and I'm aware of you know crazily skinny people kind of turning up in my feed like they used to 20 years ago and that makes me deeply uncomfortable um and I know you will have been having lots of conversations about um you know body neutrality and body reality and, and body positivity where do you think big female, uh, big beautiful female theory sits um, in a world that you know where that kind of thing comes back sometimes? Gosh, yeah, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Like it's I, really, it's horrible. <laughs> like everyone's on, um, all the celebrities are on Ozempic and they're getting you know buccal fat removal. And I see people posting about this all the time, but I feel like the time that I grew up in or came of age you know, in the 2000s, I think Beck Shaw wrote a really good article about this recently for The Guardian. Um, you know, it was kind of different then because there was so much of this stuff and you'd watch, mo you know, these teen movies with girls and they'd all be like saying, oh, you know, this girl's fat, this girl's fat, and they'd all be like the skinniest people that you'd ever seen. And, you know, the idea that like, I don't know, Bridget Jones, like at her heaviest way more, like less than I have ever weighed, you know, in my you know, entire adult life. Um, so, and that was all that there was out there. Like, you know, you'd have these magazines where Jessica Simpson was called like fat when she was, you know, like a size 10. Um, but, you know, like, I feel like this stuff does exist now and there is like a really toxic sort of pernicious element to it. But I feel like there's so much diversity of content in social media and so many different um, people on it that like I don't think you know there's never going to be that really dominant mode of uh, you know one type of body again I don't think which I think is pretty exciting it's like you know if you don't want to engage with that stuff you don't want to engage with <laughs> that um, diet culture sort of stuff you can actually pretty effectively turn away from it and not to say that it's not dangerous and it's not out there and people aren't um, sucked into it, but just to say that, like, you know, you can be informed and, you know, as, you know, teachers, as caregivers and that sort of thing, you can sort of direct um, children away from that stuff as well because there is other stuff out there. 
including big beautiful female theory which my niece is definitely definitely getting when she's about a year older have to wait a little bit Eloise but not very long um yeah I feel like 17 18 16 maybe I I would have read it when I was like 13 but I was naughty so I also would have read it when I was 13 and I was also naughty um but that is okay that is what readers do um another aspect of big beautiful female theory is the confessional so obviously you know you've said that this is memoir and there is a lot of you in here um and you have shared your you know internal experience um you know in in a piece of art I kind of um would like to talk to the question behind that which is you know what is the role of the confessional um and you know you you draw it out a little bit in in the book like you know in the past, it has been commodified. Women um, uh, and other people have been, you know, asked to sell their stories for, you know, a hundred bucks just for online clicks and stuff. And we've very much moved past that in terms of um, uh, publishing and whose story gets to be told and what stories we are willing to engage with, which is not to say anything is um, perfect or publishing is working fantastically, but it has moved on from that kind of um, clickbaity stuff. Um, and I'd like your reflections on, you know, confessional as meaning not as that kind of first generation clickbait stuff um yeah absolutely and I uh I yeah I'm obviously very wary of like the confessional it's like as it's linked to commercialism but I feel like it does definitely have a value um and I think you know, I feel like people don't really talk about like the confessional as craft or as, um, you know, as a stylistic choice or as a formal choice, um, something that's actually very, um, you know, intellectually based and something that is often used in really, um, sorry, my laptop isn't plugged in and I'm scared it's going to run out of battery. Um, there we go. Yeah. Um, so, um, like for example like a lot of these writers that are it's often like a gender term as well like these writers that are considered to be confessional and ones that I've you know really loved is like um Sylvia Plath and um you know uh Annie Erno and um uh, let me I'm trying to think of some more examples uh (laughs) Alison Bechtel um you know and like these sort of writers that write very honestly about their lives but um, it's almost like at, at a sort of craft level. So it's like playing with the idea of the self and playing with the idea of um, confession and what is revealed um, and what, you know, how you sort of represent that um, and using, you know, poetic language or using, um, you know, visual elements or using, um, yeah, different things like that. So when I was sort of approaching memoir, it was all about, always about like, the formal choices um and also Maria Tamarkin's work and Eleanor Savage's work um for an Australian example but um you know it's like thinking about um using the self as a kind of um conduit or a jumping off point rather than necessarily thinking about it as like oh I'm going to reveal everything about myself it's like you know I think there are a lot of formal decisions that go into that that sometimes get ignored, basically. So many things get ignored, but I agree with that, Eloise. Um, so we've kind of been talking about, you know, uh, the writing and, and the content that you put in, but of course there is um, an artistic um, element of this as well. And I know that you've recently um, had what I think is your first exhibition of your work, Um, the things that went into Big Beautiful Female Theory and possibly other things. What was that experience like having people view your work as, you know, art physically uh, as objects as opposed to in a printed book? Um, it's a different, really different experience, isn't it? It's, um, I feel like I'm so used to like making art and then, you know, scanning it in and putting it in a, you know, in my book and then like, it's all just sort of shoved in a drawer. Like I don't really like, I have some of it in frames and stuff now from my exhibition. So I have like them hanging, but yeah, I've never sort of like, I never sort of think about it in that way. So, um, you know, working with a curator and putting it together and, you know, laying things out 
it sort of makes me realize the immensity of what I've done and it's just like oh yeah no like I've got like hundreds of paintings um and it's yeah I feel like people engage with things in a pretty different way when they're on a on the wall and you know in a gallery space so um yeah it was quite a unique experience and I also had the opportunity when I was um at the Cité International des Arts in Paris of they have sort of weekly open studios um and you um each week like they have six people um invite people into their studios to look at their artwork and so I had um one of those and I had you know I showed some paintings and things that I was sort of working on um and it was an incredible experience to have people sort of like directly engage with it and talk to me about the work and you know have these sort of intercultural conversations and I feel like you know there's a similar sort of experience with um readings but I feel like when I'm doing a reading I don't get to um like you know people laugh and things like that but you don't get to directly engage so much with the viewer and you know when you're sort of in a gallery setting you can actually observe people sort of looking at the work and how they sort of engage with it which can be really exciting you just just mentioned the word intercultural um obviously you were in in Paris I'm not going to ask the horrible question of what are you working on next but I am going to ask um to kind of interrogate a little bit more that experience of being abroad whilst working <clears throat> whilst working on your um art <clears throat> sorry just lost my voice randomly um interrogate the idea of um being abroad whilst working on your art whilst engaging having those conversations uh, about your art and having people kind of you know there and and, and talking about the development what perspective does that, how does that change your perspective? And perhaps how does that distance from Australia help you see what we do here or what you have done here? Oh, that's a really tricky question. And I feel like it's something I'm still sort of thinking about. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's just like really interesting to sort of see people from, um, like engage with other people's work and then also have people engaging with your work and like um I don't know I feel like I've sort of become a bit um numb to what I'm doing in Australia but then having people look at it and going oh what's this this is you know like sort of being excited by it and you know um you know feeling like I I'm doing something a little bit novel or different is uh, quite exciting to me because I sort of forget that I'm like oh you know this is just what I do whatever but um but having people actually look at it and go oh I haven't seen this before and you know have conversations about it was really interesting um but I mean to be honest a lot of the sort of like experience there like there was a lot of talking about art and stuff like that but I mean a lot of the really positive experiences that I had you know in these sort of uh, discussions with people of, about ideas and things like that often they had nothing to do with art <laughs> you know it was like artists sort of talking to each other but like you know just about the way that we live our lives and you know the things that we're interested in and those sort of things and not necessarily through that like really rigid sort of um art context if that makes any sense it does it's the life that informs the art you were talking about life <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. And that's like, you know, we've had to talk a little bit about people's art, but I mean, it was when seeing the open studios definitely was more illuminating than, you know, having people talk about their art because you're like, oh, I see what you're doing here. I see like I can understand it a bit more than just that sort of, you know, talking about art, which sometimes can be a bit circuitous and you never quite get to the point of something without seeing that art itself. Now that you are back uh, in uh, Australia on Jajawaring land, I know you're working on stuff, but with that international perspective, what do you think we don't have here? Like, are you aware of, um, like you wrote, I imagine you wrote Big Beautiful Female Theory because you were thinking of your younger self and, you know, were writing something that your younger self would have been interested in or perhaps needed. Have you become aware of areas, particularly in relation to, um, graphic art um and graphic non-fiction and graphic fiction that we don't do here um I just think our um like graphic novel um like industry is just so small so there's so much room for growth in like every single direction um like I feel like 
everything that is published here is like particularly special because there is like so very little of it. Um, for example, like um, Sarah Firth's book is coming out late, later this year and it's absolutely incredible. I think um, it's going to knock people's socks off basically. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's just so exciting because we have so little of this that, you know, I guess like anything that people are doing is going to be new and exciting because it's, you know, it is such a small field at the moment. Um, and yeah, it's just, um, it's just exciting. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't, I can't remember exactly what the other part of the question was. Sorry. <laughs> I think you asked something else. Oh, look, it was quite a, um, a broad question, you know, have you become aware of anything that we're not doing here? And I think you have answered that, um, you know, noting Sarah Firth's work, which I am really looking forward to as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think my fingers crossed for the Stella for her next year. <laughs> it's be a big year on the Stella this year. Um, uh, so a final question for you. You mentioned Sarah Firth, but I am someone uh, who is an avid reader in Australia and really wants to read more graphic work, fiction, nonfiction, I, I don't mind. Um, where should I look? And are there any international authors that I should be reading in Australia? Absolutely. Um, so um, I think at the moment, Ireland is doing like a series of graphic works. So I haven't actually read them yet, but I know that Leone, Leone Briley just did one, which is incredible. And she's an absolutely incredible artist. Um, the thing is like, uh, at the moment, like a lot of people are publishing, Australians are publishing internationally. So obviously uh, Lee Lai's book Stone Fruit was really amazing, as was Tommy, Tommy Parrish's book, um, Through Fanfic Graphics. Um, Rachel Ang has a book coming out with Drawn in Quarterly, I think, next year. And she's an incredible artist to watch. Um, so, yeah, actually, sorry, my laptop didn't actually plug in before and now it's really running out. Very hello. All well, good. Um, but, uh, and internationally, um, people like, um, Alison Bechtel, um, and, uh, uh, Gillian Tamaki, um, uh, and obviously Australians like Mandy Ord as well, but I feel like a lot of these sort of, um, there's a lot of amazing self-publication going on, um, a lot of, um, zines and things like that so you know going and looking at sticky in um, the city in Melbourne or going to like zine fairs you'll often see like a much broader um yeah a broader selection of work in that sort of way and that's where people sort of get their start um but yeah and uh in terms of like international artists as well um Dominique Goblet who's like a Belgian artist just had a, a book um, published in English for the first time she's like a very like famous uh, graphic novelist overseas but only just had her first book um, published in English here called Pretending is Lying um, I read that um, earlier in the year and it's yeah pretty fantastic that is a really excellent list uh, Eloise thank you very much and um, before we go I would um, just again uh recommend big beautiful female theory to everybody who watches this um but specifically everybody who knows someone um who is a teenager or anywhere in their 20s but look I'm 42 and I love this so really any age um uh as a really beautiful way to think about um the body you inhabit and how society perceives it and what it's like to be comfortable in the body that you're in um, congratulations, Eloise, and every single prize and listing was so well deserved. Oh, thank you so much, Astrid. I really appreciate it. You are most welcome. Enjoy, everyone.